While they're doing that, check this out. Good morning. Welcome to Faith Discovery Church. My name is Jason. I'm the pastor here, and I am so honored that you've chosen to spend a little bit of your Sunday morning with us. Um, today is the first Sunday of Lent 2024. Lent actually started this past Wednesday on Valentine's Day, but today is the first Sunday, and Lent is often described as a time of preparation and an opportunity to grow deeper with God. This means it's a time for personal reflection that prepares people's hearts and minds for what's coming, Good Friday and Easter. And so here at, at FDC, each year for Lent, I encourage everyone to participate in what we call the, spir the Lenten Spiritual Growth Plan. It's, um, it's, a, it's a plan that has four steps, and we ask you to do the next step beyond what you normally do. And so the first step of, of our Latin spiritual growth plan is attend church on Sundays, all, every, to attend church every week for the next six weeks. And so if you're a person who attends here all the time, you've already made that step. But some people, church is a once a, every other week or once every three weeks or maybe a once a month, and I am not here to judge anyone. Uh, for your church attendance, but I do ask that if you're uh, not an every week church person, I ask for the next six weeks you be an every week church person. And if you've accomplished that step, the next step in our uh, spiritual growth plan is a daily devotional. And these are, we provide for free. They're out in the, in the lobby and in the foyers on, on the tables. Uh, this year it's called Lifted Up in Love. And so it's a one-page, 30-second read where just an encouraging thought for the day. And it's every day through the rest of Lent. And so if you are, uh, if this is your next step, I encourage you to Take one of these. We have, a, we have, basically, we have enough for one per family. So take one for your house and, and put it in a place where everybody can read it. Or, this is, this is my favorite, read it together at, at some point during your day, maybe at family dinner, if that happens in your house. Some houses, that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, again, no judgment. That actually doesn't happen at my house. We don't sit down and eat dinner together. Um, Partly because our kids all eat different foods and we somehow succumb to letting them do that. Uh, and so uh, it takes time to make the different meals. But I uh, encourage you to, to do this uh, as an individual or as a family. The third step uh, is uh, we are doing daily Bible reading. This year for Lent, we are reading through the book of Matthew. And in your bulletins, that's what they're called, in your bulletins is this week's 
reading plan. And so basically for, for Monday through Friday through Lent, it's all, basically one chapter a day. Read the one chapter of Matthew a day. And if we do that, what that will mean is uh, two years ago for Lent, we did the, the Gospel of John. Last year we did Luke and Mark. This year we will do Matthew. And in the first three years of our spiritual growth plan, or the last three years, we, have re- we will have read as a church all of the Gospels. And so I encourage you to participate in that and um, reading God's Word and letting that be part of your uh, just daily existence will increase your relationship with Jesus. The last one, the, the, the fourth step, is a, is a recommended reading. It's a daily reading. It's a book that you would, uh, I think they're on Amazon for $13. And the fourth step is, we have a, a book, it's called The 15 New Testament Words of Life. It's by uh, Nijay Gupta, who is actually um, my primary professor uh, in my seminary program. And not that that matters, but it's a, it's a great book. And ba- the reading plan calls for you to read about five pages a day. For some of us, that would take 10 minutes. For others of us, maybe a little longer. It's an easy read. I encourage you to do it. And, uh, and so if you'll follow those steps, if you'll walk in, the, uh, in one step beyond what you're comfortable with, what you're normally doing, uh, I believe you will start to see God work in your heart in a deeper way, and you will uh, have a testimony of God's grace. And so that's why we do it. Uh, Encourage you to participate. And then when you start to see things happen in your life, or you start to say, hey, why is this start? Am I starting to think about this more? Or you know what? I haven't had as much anxiety lately uh, during these. Why is that? Or maybe, uh, you know what? I've been sleeping better. Um... We'll start to see God do practical, applicable changes in our lives through this series, as we, uh, through, through Lent this year, as we do these things together. Um, and so today we begin a new series, uh, our 2024 Lent series, Lessons from the Letter, or Lessons from the Cities. We're going to investigate the cities that were written to in the book of Revelation. We're not going to study the entire book of Revelation in the next six weeks. Um, if you are here to ho- hoping for that, um, I'm sure that will happen someday, but it will— this next six weeks, we're going to be focusing on the cities. And where this kind of, the, the genesis of this comes from is last uh, June and July, as part of uh, my seminary experience, I went and toured six of the seven cities uh, that, are, that are written to. And so I was there uh, and uh, got some practical experience, saw the, the archaeological digs and those kinds of things, experienced some really cool things. And so I'll show you some pictures. Um, of these cities and talk to you about my experience there. Uh, And then we'll look at what was written to the city, why it was prevalent to them, how the words really translated to them, and what can we practically take? How can we apply what was written to those cities into our lives? And so that's our goal for the next six weeks. And um, today we begin our journey in Philadelphia. Some of you uh, know that Philadelphia is known as the city of brotherly love. Uh, in when the book of Revelation is written about the year 90. Um, and at, at the year 90, Philadelphia is not by Roman standards a particularly old city. It's 250, 300 years old. And um, it, it gets that name. It got the name Philadelphia because there were two kings in the region and they were brothers. And the Romans worked really hard to try to get these two kings, one, uh, these two brothers. One was named Eumenes, you know I hate names, and one was named Attalus. And at both times they were, they were kings in a region called Pergamum. And the Romans didn't like that they were these two brothers who they didn't know exactly who to give authority to, so they tried to plot them against each other. And particularly they tried to get Attalus to betray his brother, Emulus, and he wouldn't do it. He would not go against, he would not stab his brother in the back. And so because of that, his brother built a city for him, and he called it, my brother loves me, Philadelphia. And that's how the genesis of this city comes. It, this, it was not a particularly big city, it was, uh, but it was a gateway. It was, uh, an, it was stationed or 
located at the start of this big valley into places that had other major cities. And so it was a major thoroughfare and intersection of commerce and um, strategic uh, political, what am I looking for? Place, there we go. It's in a place, it's particularly even to this day known for its earthquakes. In the year 17, so think Jesus is about 20 years old. We don't know what's going on in Jesus' life at this point because we see in the Gospels, the, uh, Jesus talked about when he's 12 and then he's talked about again when he's 30. So at this time, it, this city is experiencing this during the life of Jesus. There was a massive earthquake that uh, basically crumbled the entire region. It's known for its seismic activity, but it's small. Um, and it's known for its reputation of hospitality and welcoming, much like the modern city of Philadelphia that we have in America. The nicest people with the best, no, that's not Philly's reputation. Philly's known for throwing snowballs at Santa and booing opponent teams when the players get hurt. And, uh, but there's a, there's a deep sense of loyalty in our, in our Philadelphia. It's also known for cheesesteaks. And, but you gotta, if you go to Pat's or Gino's for cheesesteaks, you gotta be careful how, like they know it's not, you're not from there if you don't order right. One time we were at, online at, at Gino's in, in Philly and it's probably, there's, they're open 24 hours if you've never been there, and there's always a line. And so we're five, probably five or six people deep in the line, and Joy says, I've never, I've never had a cheesesteak. And people looked at her like she was from Mars. And those of us who were with her took a step back. I don't know who she is. Maybe not the most loyal in that moment. But Philly has a sense of loyalty. Eagles fans, and I say Eagles because that's what they call them. We call them Eagles. Eagles fans are passionate about what, who they love. Uh, Flyers fans, hockey fans are a different breed to begin with. And uh, when, we li- when Joy and I lived in South Jersey, uh, they were passionate about how they were right and everyone else was wrong. Uh, especially Patriots fans, which I don't particularly understand why anybody would not love them, but we will move on. Uh, Philly, today the modern city, it's, uh, the modern city is called Alashier, and uh, it has just this small archaeological dig, and we can put some pictures up. This is from when I was there. There's basically a one city block that is, bi- that is on a collapsed 6th century basilica. They've taken all the relic- old relics that they found from all the digs and they just pile them in this, it's called St. John's Church. And so you walk around and there's, there's sarcophaguses, that was a word I didn't think I was going to get through today, but I'd made it. There's uh, all kinds of just uh, uh, relics from Roman times that are Christian based, crosses all over the place, and so, uh, or carvings. And so you walk through this and really of all the cities that I, I, I visited, of all the biblical uh, archeological digs that I saw, this was the most forgettable. We spent about 30 minutes there, and I think if I hadn't spent 30 minutes there, it would not have affected my trip. It was insignificant, the most insignificant 30 minutes I I spent on the trip, I think. Um, You don't travel to, to Turkey, and most of, actually, I didn't know this till I went. More biblical history took place in Turkey, in modern day Turkey, than in other, any other place other than Israel. And so if you read the book of Acts, if you, if you, or if you read the seven, the set, the seven cities uh, written to in Revelation, most of that's happening in Turkey or Asia Minor. And so uh, of, you don't go to Turkey to visit Philadelphia because it's really unmemorable. But if you're 
if you're in Turkey and you're driving through to the other places, you'll stop there just to get a sense of, of what happened. But the thing I took away the most from my, my experience from Philadelphia was its celebration of loyalty. Personally, for me, loyalty is a big thing. Um, and so I, I, enjoyed the, I enjoyed the history, the story of, of the, the establishment of the city. But, um, but from, a, from us learning about what happened in biblical times in Philly, we didn't get much. But if we read uh, Revelation 3, 7 through 13, we get a little bit more sense of, of this city, at least in the first century. And so read along with me on the screens behind me. Write, write this letter to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. Now, when it says write this, that's Jesus' instructions to John. And so Jesus instructs John to write a letter. We'll see that over the next several weeks repeated. It says, this is the message from the one who is holy and true. The one who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can close. What he closes, no one can open. I know all the things you do, and I have opened a door for you that no one can close. You have little strength, yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me. Look, I will force those who belong to Satan's synagogue, those liars who say they are Jews but are not, to come down and bow at your feet. They will acknowledge that you are the ones I love. Because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. All who are victorious will come, will become pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never have to leave it. And I will write on the name of my God, I, and I will write on them the name of my God, and they will become citizens in the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God, and I will write on them my new name. Anyone who hears to, anyone with ears to hear must listen to what the Spirit, uh, must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Interestingly, we just talked about the, the reputation that modern day Philly has of, of being a harsh and cold but loyal city. For many Roman people traveling through it, it was a welcoming city. But for the Christians in the first century, they, were, they had faced severe persecution. They had faced severe persecution from the Romans and from local Jewish people in the synagogue. For those of you who don't know kind of the history of the way churches would be established in cities, oftentimes a Jewish person would go into a city and meet with, and begin to teach about Jesus in the local synagogue. Um, because of the connection between Jesus and the Old Testament, they would begin to teach that Jesus was the, way, uh, the long-awaited Messiah. And, uh, and oftentimes what that would do is uh, they would either be accepted or rejected in the synagogue, but it would be, the momentum of that, those conversations would spill out into the city, and non-Jewish people, what the Bible calls Gentiles, would also start to hear about, and some would come to know Jesus. And so it's a city would be established. I mean, a church would be established. Oftentimes the church had uh, some Jewish people, some non-Jewish people that would not have been normal in their society for those people to intermix, but a new society forms each time a church forms. There are people here this morning that might not be the the type of people or a, a person that you would ordinarily have hung out with before you came to know Jesus. But when we come to know Jesus, we become a new person and we start to have things in common with people we didn't used to have things in common with. And we become not just friends, but family. And the thing about family is they're your family whether you like it or not. And so we start to build relationships and we build connections that 
ordinarily, we, formerly we might not have had. And this is what's happening in Philadelphia. Except there's p- particular persecution against this church, s- seemingly from people who claimed some level of Jewishness. And what scholars think happened is they excommu- excommunicated the Christians out of the church. They weren't allowed in the synagogue area at all. And they became particularly harsh to them. And so Jesus is writing to these people who the letter tells us, he says, you've been loyal, you've been obedient, you've stayed true to my word. You haven't crumbled in the face of persecution. And because of that, I'm going to bat for you, is basically what Jesus says. Um, it was not a particularly large city, like I say. In fact, mo- and wa- most scholars in, in the group of seven cities that are listed as le- written letters to, they don't understand why Philadelphia is one. It was too insignificant a city in the Roman world for it to have gotten a letter. But there are times where things seem insignificant to the world that are not insignificant to God. There are times where we seem insignificant to people, but we are not insignificant to God. And so to this church that has little earthly significance, God writes a letter that's still impacting thousands of years later. And so he said, uh, the, the, the church, the letter says the church in Philadelphia was powerless. At the beginning of the letter, Jesus says that he has a master key, that he uh, has opened a door that no one can shut. There are multiple thoughts about why this they, th- we, would have been written this way. The city's strategic location offered opportunities for evangelism and missional work all through the valley. If this city becomes on fire for Jesus, it's going to have impact for everybody trying to get to the other cities because they're going to walk right through and see what God is doing in this group of people. So there's an idea that I've opened a door for you to be missional. But more likely than that, he's saying, you've been locked out of your church in a very physical way. But that doesn't mean you've been locked out of my church in a very spiritual way. And so out of this uh, really difficult time, this letter starts to uh, inspire hope into the people. It, it, the illustration works in a larger manner. The illustration of an open door to Philadelphia underscores themes of opportunity, of divine providence, of spiritual blessings, and intimate communion with God. It serves as a powerful illustration and symbol of God's faithfulness to his people and his invitation uh, to them or for them to participate in his redemptive work. It might be difficult. Stay true to me and see what I might do. It's a powerful invitation from God. To this little powerless church, Jesus is declaring that they can be confident uh, that they, in a spiritual sense, uh, are neither little or powerless. In Jesus' eyes, their power or lack thereof was pointless. When God calls us into something, God has a purpose and a plan for every single one of us. Now, some of you have heard your whole lives, your parents didn't have a plan for you, that you were a mistake, that you just showed up. Oops. And that might be true. But God had a plan for you. And he wasn't surprised that you just showed up. And so for each one of us, God has a plan and a purpose. And he has the provision to make that plan and purpose come true. And so for this little city, this little church, this little insignificant nothing, Jesus says, you're not nothing. You're not insignificant because I'm giving you my power. So your earthly power doesn't matter. When God calls you into a part of his purpose, your ability or your power or your ability to make that happen is not as important as God's ability to make that happen and your obedience to walk into what God leads you into. But that seems counterintuitive to what I know because my whole life 
Whatever I've got, I've had to make happen. Yes. God's systems do not work the way our systems do. And so in this little city of Philadelphia, this little church, they find that God's power is more important than theirs. Studies show that the average sized church in the United States is about 65 to 70 people. 70% of American churches have fewer than 100 people attending. Yet small church America often leads to a higher level of commitment. Small churches tend to have a higher percentage of participants serving in their ministries. Like so, like so many churches in the United States, Philadelphia's believers, their, their members, they were faithful and resilient witnesses to Jesus. It wasn't easy. There were times where it was con- inconvenient. But they were faithful and resilient. So much so that when Jesus writes this letter, he, ne- he notices that about them. Their characteristic is their faithfulness. Philadelphia gets, Philadelphia's letter is all commendation, no criticism. That won't be the case as we move through into the other cities. Jesus is watching them. He knows them intimately, and he is at work among them. Their works involved acts of compassion, love, and justice, as well as witnessing about Jesus and worshiping him as Lord of Lords. Their actions opened doors for these faithful Christians in this small church. The Christians in Philadelphia were faithful. The the church in Philadelphia was powerless. That didn't matter. Because Jesus' power is what matters. The Christians in this church were faithful. As an aside, it's hard to remain faithful when things aren't easy. This church, this church, not the church we're going to talk about. From all records I can find, we've been a church since 1931. That's... 93 years. In those 93 years, there have been periods of time where it was not easy. Some of you have been part of this church when it was particularly difficult. And just by you sitting here today is recognition of your faithfulness in times of difficulty. When we, when we come together... One of the wonderful things that makes up the church is people. One of the hardest things about being at church is people. We are not always perfect. We don't always do things well. There are times where we experience tension. There are times where we say the wrong thing at the wrong time. There are times when we hurt each other. And in those moments, the easy thing is to run away and to leave, to go somewhere else or go nowhere. But in the middle of that, in the middle of those experiences, there is a, the Holy Spirit is at work in us, encouraging us to remain faithful. You see, uh, the, the, the test of faithfulness is in the difficult times. In the easy times, it's easy to be faithful. But when it's difficult, and the Holy Spirit's encouraging us to do what is not natural, encouraging us to spend less time protecting ourselves and more time being open to serving and to be obedient. Jesus notices that. And in the moments where it's difficult, in the moments where you're hurt, the moments where you've experienced tension, or the moments where you're uncomfortable, I had one person say to me this week, I love our church. So, and so we started to dig into that conversation. How do, how do you determine... If how you, that you know you love our church. And this person's determination was, I like waking up on Sunday mornings and getting ready to go to church. That's awesome. 
I love that that's the experience. I'm not a morning person, except on Sundays. Because this is like a, I mean, this is energizing for me to be here on Sundays. But I'm glad that I'm not the only one who's experiencing that. But I also appreciate that in the moments where it's not that, that way in the history of this church, everybody didn't just stop coming. Because we're here today because people were faithful in difficult times. And they were faithful in good times. And I hope the next 93 years are all good. But I'm guessing we're going to be mad at each other sometimes. I'm going to be here 93 years from now, by the way. You're all invited. The Christians in Philadelphia were faithful. Small they may have been. But when pressure came from authorities in Philadelphia, uh, they remained faithful. Faithful to Jesus, to the one who loved them in their witness and their worship. This same sense of, of resilience is also seen in their perseverance against those who, Jesus says, belong to Satan's synagogue, likely Jewish people who had been persecuting Christians. Jesus calls these, uh, praises these Philadelphian Christians because they have kept the word of God. He was aware of their plight, and he was personally intervening for them. We have spent the last several weeks unpacking Jesus' explanation of, of the culture of the kingdom of heaven through the Sermon on the Mount. And if you remember, I proposed that when we were reading the Beatitudes where it says, blessed, insert, citizens of the kingdom of heaven are. God's kingdom celebrates humility. It celebrates peace-loving people. It celebrates merciful people. And in that kingdom, justice is not punitive-seeking, but it's merciful. It's kind. Jesus praises the church in Philadelphia because they are choosing to exhibit the attributes of the kingdom of heaven rather than the, the rule of man. In the difficult moments, they're choosing to be kingdom citizens rather than citizens of Rome. It's easy to be self-serving. Now, that sounds like really harsh, and no one wants to be self-serving. But it, let me change the phrase. It's really easy to take care of yourself. We're taught to do that. If you, don't take, if you don't watch out for you, who's gonna? Ever heard that? That's the way of the kingdom of man. The kingdom of heaven says, I'm gonna put others first. And Jesus sees a small, insignificant church and says they're neither small or insignificant because they are exhibiting and choosing to live out the ways of the kingdom. Jesus knows when we face adversity uh, and his protection increases when we persevere. The letter to Philadelphia highlights the, uh, that Jesus is in, uh, highlights Jesus' intimate knowledge of the plight of his followers and his unwavering commitment for their well-being. It reminds us as believers that Jesus is not distant or indifferent to our struggles. If you're here this morning and you're having struggles, Jesus is not distant from or indifferent to your struggles. But he's intimately involved in our lives, providing us strength and guidance and protection amidst adversity. As believers, we can take comfort in the assurance that Jesus knows our plight. He em uh, em empathizes with our struggles and he walks alongside us in every season of our life. This knowledge could and should inspire us to remain faithful, to persevere in our faith, and to trust in God's promises, knowing that he is always with us, empowering us to overcome every obstacle and to experience the fullness of his blessings and his rewards. Despite any weaknesses or vulnerabilities, Jesus, is, Jesus recognizes and appreciates the steadfastness and commitment of those who are faithful to him. His mercy is extended to those who earnestly seek to follow him and the importance of God's mercy in the lives of his believers and his willingness to extend compassion and grace to those who trust him are the fuel 
that allows us to keep on going on. The, metri- the, the metrics of the kingdom of heaven are not society's metrics. This is true both in and outside our religious circles. When you think about the Christian church in America today and how we decide how impactful or or important a church is, the metrics we use do not often line up with the heart of Jesus. When we think, and I'll give you a little bit of inside baseball, when we celebrate churches, when we read magazines about the fastest growing churches in America, we talk about the amount of people who go there, the amount of money they make, they take in, how many people they've seen come to Jesus or how many people they've baptized or even the number of buildings or campuses they have. And while those are wonderful things, we we should be celebrating churches seeing more people come to Jesus and more people being baptized and letting their commitment to to Jesus be known. But those aren't the metrics of Jesus. I want to be very honest with you today. I can easily be grafted into the incorrect, to an incorrect mindset. There are, more, there are mornings where, my, where I, my focus is, I want more people to come to our church. And let me be very clear. I want more people to come to, to our church. I love the orange, but I'd really like to not, have, not see it on Sunday mornings. But when that becomes my goal, I don't want to see orange rather than, or I just want more people to come to our church because I want us to be a, a bigger church because I want to, other pastors to say, wow, that guy's doing a good job. I've missed the boat. It's not about me. It's not about how good a job I'm doing. It's not about how much credit I'll get when I don't see any orange. It's about administering and being open to the kingdom's metrics. I want us, as your, uh, I want my focus to be on how healthy are we, are we are as a church. If we're healthy, if we're caring for each other, we're going to grow. Jesus said he'll build this church. But good things can become bad things when you let them become the primary thing. The primary thing is Jesus. The primary thing is creating an atmosphere where people can experience his presence. When that happens, more people will come. And when more people come, we have to be sure that we're still prioritizing Jesus and allowing people to experience his presence. That's the metric of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus measures good works of compassion and justice. He measures faithfulness. He measures love for one another. He measures a resilient witness. The The church in Philadelphia would not have held a regional conference. None of the major worship bands of the day would have went to their church. Their online services were not well attended and they didn't have huge merchandise sales. I hope you're getting the illustration and not thinking that they had online services. They weren't the popular thing happening they would have been easily overlooked, except Jesus doesn't overlook the easily overlooked. Jesus says, I'll write my name on you and you'll be part of my city, my new city. When other people don't welcome you because of Jesus, Jesus welcomes you because he appreciates your commitment and your faithfulness. When other people think you're insignificant or not noticeable, or there's nothing really to celebrate about you, or let me be very honest, when you think you're nothing or insignificant, or there's nothing really to celebrate about you. When you brush your teeth in the morning and you look in the mirror and you're not really proud of the person that you see. Jesus is really proud of the person that you see. Jesus wants to empower the person that you see. And he says, your power is not really important here. It's my power at work inside of you that's important here. Because through 
the power of Jesus, we can experience the miraculous. The city of Philadelphia was celebrated because of its faithfulness. Jesus celebrated them because of their faithfulness. Wherever you are in your station right now. Some of you had a great week. You're in the middle of a great season. Some of you don't know what this week holds. Whatever season you're in, choose to be faithful. And let's see what his power will do through this little church in Northwestern New Jersey that's just seeking to make a difference and introduce people to Jesus. Would you pray with me? Jesus, sometimes it's hard for us to not focus on the things the world says is important. Help us to focus on what you say is important. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak to us in moments where we start to become aware of what's going on around us rather than the person or the God who is working, at work within us. In your name we pray. We're going to end this morning with communion. It's something we do at just about the end of each service. And so I'm going to invite Doc and Laura to come forward and serve. And if you're new with us, what we do is we, we come forward, we stand, we come to the center aisle that's closer to us and come forward. We receive the elements and bring them back to our seat and we'll share communion together. You don't have to be a member here to participate. You're more than welcome to join us, but there's no pressure. If you don't want to, that's okay too. Please come forward.